Legends of the Cthulhu People say that the name was given after seven of the wisest men of the ancient Cherokees went to the highest peak and fasted for seven days and nights, asking the Creator for guidance. This peak is known today as Clemens Dome. On the seventh night of their fast, the Creator told them, You shall be Cthulhu. Cthulhu Mound, located near what is present day Bryson City, North Carolina, is understood as the mother town and the place where the Creator gave the laws and first fire to the people. The Eastern Band Cultural Office reports this place wasn't just a town, this was the mother town, the place where the Cherokee began. The Cthulhu people originally lived in the southeastern part of the United States on lands forming present day Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, North Carolina, and South Carolina. Archaeologists say that Cotua Cherokee families began migrating to a new home in Arkansas by the late 1790s. In 1808, a delegation of Cherokees from the upper and lower towns of Cherokee Nation went to Washington, D.C. to inform the president not all Cherokee people wanted to pursue what was deemed a civilized life. The delegation requested that the president divide the upper towns whose people wanted to establish a regular government from the lower towns who wanted to continue living traditionally. On January 9, 1809, President Jefferson allowed the lower towns to send an exploring party to find suitable lands on the Arkansas and White Rivers. Seven of the most trusted men explored locations both in what is now western Arkansas and also northeastern Oklahoma. The people of the lower towns desired to remove across the Mississippi to this area onto vacant lands within the United States so that they might continue the traditional Katua way of life. In 1817, the United States ceded these lands to Katua people, also known as Western Cherokee and later as Old Settlers. In exchange for a portion of the Cherokee lands they had occupied and were entitled to in the east, as many as four to seven thousand Katua old settlers came. The Treaty of 1817 with the United States exchanged lands back east for lands in Arkansas. This gained the Katua a definite title to a territory, what is called today a land base. The Arkansas Cherokee requested the U.S. recognize the Eastern and Western Cherokee as two separate and distinct nations. Further, the Treaty of 1817 stipulated that the treaties heretofore between the Cherokee Nation and the United States are to continue in full force with both parties of the nation and both parts thereof entitled to all the immunities and privileges which the old nation enjoyed under the aforesaid treaties. Unlike the old Cherokee Nation, the Western Cherokee Katua readily accepted Sequoia's Cherokee syllabary in 1822. Then Chief Dakadoka was opposed to the introduction of the mission schools and greatly influenced the acceptance of a way to write the Katua people's own language. By 1828, the Katua people entered into a treaty with the United States to move onto lands further west. This treaty granted the Western Cherokees land running along the Arkansas, Canadian, and Grand Rivers. They were also given a perpetual outlet west as far as the sovereignty of the United States extended. By the Treaty of 1828, the Katua moved to Indian Territory in Oklahoma ten years prior to the forced removal of the Cherokee Nation. Between 1828 and 1839, a capital was established east of Chief Jolly's home, about two miles up the Illinois from its mouth on the Arkansas. The council house, grounds, and home of this first chief made up the national capital called Tolentesky to honor the chief's brother, the former chief. The general council met here for 11 years. In 1833, Old Settler or Western Cherokee Katua met with the Muscogee Creek Nation at Cantonment Gibson to settle boundary disputes and precisely establish the boundaries of the new territory. Creeks who had been removed from the east in 1826-27 to 27 had found themselves living within the newly established Cherokee lands and were required to move again. The treaty fixed the boundaries for what would become known as the Cherokee Nation of Indian Territory after the Trail of Tears in 1839. The old settlers enjoyed only a few years of peace before being joined by the treaty party and ultimately 
by the Eastern Cherokee, marking the beginning of the Cherokee Civil War. After the influx of the Eastern Cherokee from the Trail of Tears, the Easterners greatly outnumbered the Western Fullbloods and tensions began to mount. The Eastern newcomers wanted their form of government to replace the government which was already in place. The Western Cherokee, of course, objected to such displacement of their own powers and was also against the provisions of the Treaty of New Echota. Both the Western Cherokees and the Eastern Cherokees objected to the Treaty of New Echota, stating that the signers had not been authorized. However, the Western Cherokee sent two delegates, James Rogers and John Smith, to make sure the provisions in the treaty were clear about the position Cherokee Nation would have when arriving in Western Cherokee territory. The provision in the treaty, signed by the two Katua, assured Cherokee Nation of a friendly disposition of their people and their desire that the nation should be united again as one people. But this uniting was meant to be with the Cherokee Nation joining the Western Cherokee government. The provision assured them a hearty welcome and an equal participation with them in all the benefits and privileges of the Cherokee Country West. The provision concluded with, but it is expressly understood that nothing in this treaty shall affect any claims of the Western Cherokee on the United States. The Western Cherokees gave welcome to their friends and family without complaint. They said there was room enough for all. <laughs>